Happy Thanksgiving, General Bio 1. Let's talk about Chapter 18, Regulation of Gene Expression. Be sure to go over the preview review questions carefully and ask me if you have any questions. So prokaryotes and eukaryotes can actually alter which genes are expressed and when in response to their changing environment. That allows them to transcribe and translate the genes that are at need at that moment in that particular point in their lives. And of course, for multicellular eukaryotes, gene expression is going to regulate development of the individual. And maybe you can recognize uh, what kind of organism is developing in the series of pictures on the right side of the screen there. You know the answer to the clicker question? So of course, C. elegans elegans is a multicellular animal and it has less than a thousand cells in its whole body. And yet still, each of those cells receives information about what genes to turn on, which genes to express, when and for how long in order to develop its entire phenotype. Of course, bacteria also need to be able to respond to the external environment and to environmental change, and they also can regulate transcription. So what genes are activated, transcribed, and translated into proteins during what part of their single-celled lives? So natural selection, of course, will favor bacteria that are not producing every single polypeptide possible, but those ones that they need right now. And gene expression in bacteria is controlled by a system that's called the operon. And that's going to be the major theme in this lecture, at least for the first part. Study this picture. Notice that on the left side, we're looking at feedback for regulating enzyme activity. And on the right side, we're looking at feedback that regulates not the activity of the enzyme, but in fact the enzyme production. And if you study this picture, you can see that towards the top of the screen, we're starting with some kind of precursor, a chemical that's present in the cell. And there's an enzyme that facilitates a reaction, and we get a product. A second enzyme facilitates another reaction, we get another product, and a third enzyme can facilitate yet another reaction for us to get the product, which is tryptophan. And tryptophan, you may remember, is one of the amino acids. Now, how do we produce those enzymes? Well, of course, there are genes that are responsible for producing the enzymes that are important in this overall metabolic reaction. So how many different polypeptides have to be transcribed and translated in order to synthesize tryptophan? Go ahead and look at the right side of the screen and see if you can come up with an answer. So notice that we have the trip E, trip D, trip C, trip B, and trip A genes. So there's one, two, three, four, five different polypeptides that have to be transcribed in order to make one, two, three different functional proteins that are acting as enzymes in this reaction. And so wouldn't it be useful if all of these genes could be triggered at one time? And that's the basic concept of the operon. So the operon essentially is a group of genes that are all important in the same sort of functional product, and they're under the control of a single on-off switch, because when one of them is needed, they're all needed. Or, if none of, one of them is not needed, probably all of them are not needed. And so the switch is a piece of DNA that we're going to term the operator. The operator is usually in the promoter region. You'll remember we looked at the promoter region, which signals this is the starting point for transcribing a gene region. And so the operator is a piece of DNA, usually in the promoter region, in that Tata box region that you see in the picture on the right. And the operon itself is a stretch of DNA. It includes the operator, that's like the on-off switch. It includes the promoter region for the gene. And then it also includes all of the genes under its control. So let's look at an example that's from Escherichia coli, which is the exact species of bacteria that we feed to the Cenorhabditis elegans worms. And we're going to look at a famous operon. It's called the tryptophan operon, which is the one that we were introducing with the feedback picture that you see in the upper right corner on this slide. So 
Let's get a look at this overall. We have the trip operon. You see the promoter region. You can see there's RNA polymerase ready to transcribe. There's a segment there that's called the operator that's in the promoter region. And right now it looks like RNA polymerase could smoothly slide along there and start to transcribe those genes. And then the messenger RNA would connect at the ribosome and be used to translate for one, two, three, four, five. Looks like there's five gene products, right? Five polypeptides. And those five polypeptides are going to form the three enzymes that are required. But what about that red segment? This to the left side. You see that red piece that's labeled the inactive repressor. To repress means to stop or prevent from happening. And so the inactive repressor cannot repress. But guess what it can do when it's active? Doesn't it look like those two little pegs would slot right into the operator and prevent the RNA polymerase from moving forward? Let's see how that works. So here we are. When tryptophan, which remember is the end product, when tryptophan, the amino acid that's the end product, when it's present inside that bacterial cell, it can interact with the repressor molecule. So see the inactive repressor, tryptophan interacts with it, and then the active repressor is now the right structure to interact with the operator in the promoter region. And when it does that, then the RNA polymerase, it cannot move forward, it cannot make messenger RNA, and none of those genes will be transcribed. We already have tryptophan, no need to make any more. The tryptophan interacts with the repressor, the repressor becomes active, it shuts the process down. And so that's negative feedback. We're inhibiting the production of more tryptophan by shutting the process down. And so here it is all put together. If you look up at the top, we're exploring the operon itself with an inactive repressor. The inactive repressor, it does not act with the operator. And so RNA polymerase will smoothly glide along past the operator, and it will start to transcribe trip E, trip D, trip C, trip B, and trip A, until we have all five polypeptides translated at the ribosomes. Once we have all five polypeptides, we can make the three enzymes that are needed to produce tryptophan. But once tryptophan begins to build up inside that bacterial cell, then the abundance of tryptophan means that tryptophan itself will interact with the repressor and activate it. So tryptophan plus repressor results in an active repressor, and because of its shape, it can interact with the operator, and it shuts the process down. So if we have lots of tryptophan, we don't need to make more. And so what we've seen is regulation of enzyme production, because now we're repressing the entire operon. So we're really considering what we see on the right side of the screen here, negative feedback by preventing the additional transcription and translation of the genes that are involved in making the enzymes. So as it turns out, there are two types of negative gene regulation. The first type is called the repressible operon. So a repressible operon, normally its state is that it's turned on. Genes are being transcribed and translated. When the repressor binds to the operator, it works like an off switch. So normally the operator is on, but the repressor can shut it down. So go ahead and answer that clicker question in your mind. In the trip operon, was that repressible or was it inducible? Let's consider what inducible means. Inducible, normally the system is turned off. But when the right molecule is present, the inducer will actually inactivate the repressor so it makes the repressor not work, and it induces the system to turn on. So repressible, normally on, the repressor shuts it down. Inducible is normally off, 
and an inducer can inactivate the repressor. So which one was the trip operon? Was that repressible or inducible? That's right, it's repressible. Normally the trip operon is turned on, but when there's plenty of tryptophan, tryptophan interacts with the repressor and it shuts the operator down like an off switch. So let's consider an inducible operon. This one is also found in bacteria. It's called the LAC operon. And what the LAC operon does is it contains genes that code for enzymes, and the enzymes are used in breaking down and metabolizing milk sugar. So do we need to be able to break down milk sugar when there's no milk sugar present? No. And so this is an inducible operon. It's usually shut off. But when lactose is present, we can switch it on and then be able to break down the lactose. So by itself, the lac repressor is active and it's switching the lac operon off. It's not until the inducer interacts with the repressor that the repressor no longer works. And then the lac operon turns on. So it's still like an on-off switch, but in this case, normally off, we have to induce it to turn on by inactivating or deactivating the repressor. So here's what it looks like. You can see the DNA at the top. You see there's a regulatory gene. The regulatory gene is responsible for creating the repressor, but the repressor all on its own can interact with the operator to shut the system down. You see the promoter region, you see the RNA polymerase trying to act, but it can't because the repressor in its normal form interacts with the operator to turn the switch off. But look what happens when allolactose is present. So allolactose is a form of lactose. When it's present, it acts like an inducer. And so it interacts with the repressor so that the repressor cannot work. You can see that when you have the combination of allolactose and the repressor, the repressor undergoes a shape change and it can no longer function to shut off the operon. Now RNA polymerase can simply glide along the molecule and begin to transcribe and translate for the enzymes that are responsible for breaking down lactose during metabolism. And so if we put it all together, remember this is an inducible operon. In the inducible operon, it's normally turned off. Not until a certain molecule is present inside the cell is it necessary to transcribe those genes. And so our allolactose interacts with the repressor. It interferes with the repressor, makes it not work. And now the system is turned on. Of course, we don't need the enzymes for breaking down lactose and lactose is present. And that's exactly how the inducible operator works. And so inducible enzymes are usually important in catabolic pathways. And in fact, they're induced by that chemical signal. So what we saw here is that when lactose is present, now we need the enzymes for breaking it down. And so it's the presence of lactose itself that induces the production of those enzymes. Repressible enzymes are usually found in anabolic pathways. And so when we have enough of the end product, the end product itself can suppress the production of any more. So let's switch gears a little bit and consider eukaryotic gene expression. So eukaryotic gene expression can also be regulated at any stage. So if you think about it, eukaryotic organisms, whether we're talking single-celled or multi-celled, whether we're talking about amoeba or paramecium, single-celled protists, uh, multicellular plants, multicellular animals, multicellular fungi, all organisms need to regulate which genes are expressed when and even for how long. And so think about it. All of the somatic cells in your body contain exactly the same DNA. And yet, we have all these different tissue types. And so we have the same DNA, but different cell types. And the way in which we get differences in the phenotype from tissue to tissue to tissue has to do with which genes are expressed, when during development, and for how long. 
And so a program of differential gene expression leads to the different cell types that we have in multicellular organisms. And in part, it's their location within the body of that individual cell that gives it information about how to proceed and what genes to activate. And so how do we go from embryo to a newborn, like the chimpanzee you see here? Different genes are expressed for different amounts of time in different parts of the body. So the fertilized egg contains many different cell types, and then the expression of the genes is controlling the progression of that development. So there are three major processes that are involved in the transformation from the zygote. Remember, the zygote is the fertilized egg before it begins to divide. So we're talking about a diploid individual. Egg and sperm have fused the nuclei but we haven't had any cell division yet, no mitosis. So we need cell division, cell differentiation, which occurs when different genes are expressed to result in the cells heading down one pathway of development versus another, and then morphogenesis, the development of the body plan. And in fact, it's materials within the egg that set up gene regulation that's carried out as the cells divide. And so the egg itself, remember, contains lots of nutrients. It contains all of the different cellular components, including the mitochondria, which have their own DNA, which comes from your maternal side. And so the materials in the egg and the way those first few cell divisions occur will set up the way in which the genes are regulated to turn on, turn off, and for how long they should be on. And of course, this is a big process. If you look at the fertilized eggs of a frog, there's a lot of development that occurs before we have the newly hatched tadpole. And in fact, with frogs, they undergo further transformation when they reach sexual immaturity and emerge from the pond, develop their legs, develop lungs, and reabsorb the tail. So within the egg cytoplasm, not only are there mitochondria and all the organelles, ribosomes, but there's also RNA, proteins, many substances which were present within that maternal cell. Remember that the sperm cell itself donates basically just the genetic material. But if you think about it, those substances are not perfectly evenly distributed inside the egg cell. And so as the cell, as the zygote, begins to undergo mitosis, to go from one cell to two, two cells to four, four cells to eight, and so on, then those substances inside the cytoplasm may be divided up unevenly. And so maternal egg substances can influence that early development because different amounts in the different sides of what you see the two-celled embryo down below, they're going to result in differential gene expression in those two new cells. And so this is just a rough example to give you an idea, but remember during cytokinesis, we have just simple dividing in half. There's not any special allocation to make sure that both sides have equal numbers of mitochondria, equal amounts of Golgi apparatus, there's nothing like that. And so it's somewhat arbitrary, but based on the way that the mother has set up the egg, we end up with two cells, which now are somewhat different. Even though they have the same DNA, they're different because of the material that's present in the cytoplasm. And so in addition to there being maternal influences in terms of the way the egg itself is set up, the cell's environment also plays a role. And so you're looking at a real embryonic uh, cell there up on the right side, 32 cell stage, and then that sort of corresponds with the illustration you see of an early embryo, 32 cells. So cell interactions direct differentiation. Cells that are more towards the outside of the embryo are interacting with the outside world. Cells that are surrounded by cells are interacting entirely within the tissue. And so induction is the process by which cells can send a signal molecule and cause differences in transcription in other cells to turn genes on 
turn genes off or have them on for different lengths of time. And so this is tying in with what we've talked about previously with cell signaling. And so as the cells continue to divide, new cells develop, determination commits the cell to its final fate. And so as the embryo continues to age and grow more additional cells, through time, the influence of those signals makes it so that a cell can't back up and go down a different pathway, but in fact will become the end cell that's appropriate for its location within that developing body. And so that's going to happen during morphogenesis, the formation of the overall body form. So as an example here, you see some stem cells. Stem cells are totipotent. They can become any kind of cell in the body as long as they receive the right signals. But as they continue to differentiate, they may become only multipotent. There are only certain kinds of things they can become. And eventually, depending on where they are in the body, they become committed to one pathway or another. And so here you can see at the end points, the mature cells include a variety of types of blood cells and immune cells, but originally they all originated from the same stem cell type. And so let's talk also about setting up the body plan. So pattern formation. I don't want to show you a real dissected rat over the holiday. So here you have one that's knitted. I think you can find pictures of this thing on the internet. Knitted rat dissection. So pattern formation starts with setting up the basic body plan. So setting up the major axes, and that's going to be done by positional information. So molecular cues are telling the cell its location. Does it have a high concentration of a substance? It knows it's close to one end of the cell or one end of the embryo. Does it have a low concentration? Well, it must be further away from the place where that signal molecule is being produced. And so let's make sure you know your basic body plans. Here are the body axes. The dorsal is the back, the ventral is the belly, the head end is the anterior, the tail end is the posterior, and if there's an anterior and a posterior and a dorsal and a ventral, then in a, an animal that has bilateral symmetry like this fruit fly, then now we have a left side and a right side. And it really is the cytoplasmic determinants in the egg cell that determines these axes. And it's true in Drosophila melanogaster, the fruit fly, as much as it is true in humans. And so these maternal effect genes are also called egg polarity genes. So let's see what you see in the picture here. We're looking at development of that fruit fly that we see in the upper picture as an adult, development from the egg cell all the way through to the larva or the maggot stage, right? So baby fly is called a maggot. So you see the egg cell, you can see where the nucleus is, and you can see that it's got some nurse cell substance there. And you can already guess that as the unfertilized egg is continuing to build, that we're going to have uneven distribution of materials. And in fact, you can see the nucleus moving. Finally, the egg is fertilized and laid. And then as we continue to divide the cell, different information is in different parts of the body. And that different concentration of the materials in the cytoplasm is going to result in the dorsal side, the ventral side, the anterior, the posterior, and then the left and the right. And now signals that are produced at one end of the body are going to be at high concentration in cells in that end of the body, say in the head end, and materials, substances, signals that are produced in the posterior end of the body will be at high concentration posterior and at lower concentration as we move towards the head. And if you're interested in this, then I highly recommend this book. It's called Coming to Life, How Genes Drive Development, and it's by a Nobel laureate in biochemistry and medicine. And it's a pretty easy read, and it has her own hand-drawn pictures in there that are pretty neat to see. So strongly recommend it. Hope you enjoyed this lecture, and we're going to follow up with a quick lecture from the next chapter as well.